Well, much of the mainstream media cycles last week were mired in chatter about U.N. Ambassador Susan Rice and the possibility she may be considered to take over as Secretary of State once Hillary Clinton leaves her post. And most of what you probably heard sounded something like this. We are significantly troubled by many of the answers that we got and some that we didn't get. Bottom line, I'm more disturbed now than I was before. We will not allow a brilliant public servant's record to be mugged, to cut off her, her consideration to become Secretary of State. I think Republicans are making a big mistake. The first thing they do after the election is start attacking an African-American woman uh, without any cause, by the way. This is somebody who had nothing to do with Benghazi. She was given CIA information. The CIA told her, here's what I think is appropriate to say. Of course, it's only racism when it's directed toward a, uh, a liberal or a Democrat. It's never racism toward a Republican. Look, if this was Condoleezza Rice and not Susan Rice, Alan would be on the other side of this camera right. basically su suggesting that she deserves to either resign or she did something no. wrong. Well, as you can imagine, the Obama administration was a little annoyed about so much attention being paid to Ambassador Rice. I was at last Tuesday's press briefing at the White House, and question after question was about Susan Rice and who knew what, when about the Benghazi attacks that took place. Well, here was one of White House spokesman Jay Carney's responses to those barrage of questions he got. Can I just say, Chuck, that this is again, what is the point of the focus on this? It could have been me. It could have been Ambassador Rice. I mean, I took questions on this, too. And, and we all uh, relied on uh, information from the intelligence community. The focus on a Sunday show appearance is entirely misplaced, and it represents uh, uh, less interest, I think, in what happened in Benghazi uh, than in uh, political dynamics in Washington. And you know what? He's right. The media is focused on the wrong thing. If they want to focus on Susan Rice, that's fine. But this overkill of her allegedly misleading the American people based on vague information she may have gotten might not be the most significant thing here. If they want to focus on the potential of her becoming Secretary of State and the issues stemming from that, let's look at who Susan Rice is and what she represents. Here's some food for thought. Susan Rice is worth between 23 and $43 million, making her the wealthiest member of the executive branch. According to the Center for Responsive Politics, she has investments in companies like TransCanada Corporation, Sunker, and Imperial Oil Limited. And that's just the beginning. Everything you see in yellow up here is something she has a stake in. And when you look closely, millions of dollars of assets in these Canadian utility companies and banks, which make up a third of her total investments. Now, if confirmed by the Senate as the Secretary of State, one of the first items on Rice's agenda would be to weigh in on and eventually make a decision about the Keystone Pipeline. Now, this is just the beginning of some major concerns about Rice, and joining me to discuss this further is Michael Brooks, producer at The Majority Report. Hey there, Michael. Um, what do you think is more important in determining uh, whether Rice is a good candidate for Secretary of State? I mean, her so-called misspeak about Benghazi on the morning shows, or her financial holdings and relevant actions? Well, definitely her financial holdings in, uh, in TransCanada. And, you know, unfortunately, this is part of a pattern with the State Department and this issue in general. You know, you had lobbyists uh, who were senior officials on Hillary Clinton's campaign lobbying her uh, on the pipeline. Um, fortunately, you know, the pipeline was delayed by the administration, I think, due to the effort of activists on the ground. Um, you know, and I think if we look at climate change as the security issue, it really is. You could in some ways see, uh, you know, uh, Rice's holdings in these companies as analogous to the Surgeon General, uh, you know, having holdings in tobacco companies. It doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, it's something she should address. Uh, and it's not just um, these investments. I know back in 1994, Susan Rice was working for the Clinton administration as a junior official uh, for the National Security Council uh, and helped to shape U.S. policy toward Central Africa during and after the Rwandan genocide as Rwanda invaded neighboring countries to find Hutus. Uh, talk a little bit about some of the criticisms of Susan Rice, um, you know, in this. Well, I, I think that Ambassador Rice in this regard is really just reflective of a lot of even President Clinton himself and a lot of figures from that administration because basically uh, they were unresponsive to a genocide that you know took place in real time. Um, it was clear what was happening uh, and due to other concerns about not wanting to get bogged down 
in Africa due to the uh, Marines being killed in Mogadishu the year before in 1993, they didn't want to uh, intervene. Uh, and this really horrific event happened. Now the tendency coming out of that has been on the opposite extreme, which has been to look the other way uh, as the Rwandan government under Paul Kagame has a questionable domestic record, although some real significant domestic uh, successes, but also uh, really plays kind of warlord and rebel po politics across uh, Central Africa. So I think, um, you know, Ambassador Rice is uh, she kind of just embodies a lot of these tendencies of the Clinton administration and officials who were involved in both sides of both uh, letting what happened in Rwanda happen and then probably going too far on the other extreme of being too forgiving of, uh, of the Rwandan government. Uh, it's so interesting to me because uh, the position of Secretary of State uh, is so important in terms of representing this country uh, on an international scale. So why are we not hearing in the mainstream media about uh, decisions like this, decisions, uh, policy shaping um, ideas about Africa? This is not what we're hearing. Well, because, you know, these are more uh, complex topics. They're a little bit, uh, they're not in the news cycle, although obviously there's a lot happening in Congo right now that's relevant to this discussion, like you point out. Uh, but Benghazi is the Saturday or Sunday morning, you know, argument topic right now. And it's partisan and it's easy to fit into sound bites. Uh, and people are scoring points. And uh, it's easy to cover and easy to have uh, people to come on and argue with each other about. It's not to say that what happened in Benghazi isn't really important and worthy of, of, of talking about. But her role in it was very limited. You know, she read some talking points that were prepared for her. Uh, and uh, as you say, it's really not in any way central to evaluating her record. I think it's interesting what you said, Michael, that, that it's a little more complicated to talk about the issues in Africa, to talk about, um, you, you know, but... Uh, I think that investments and holdings in these major companies that you're going to have uh, a role in making decisions on, I mean, this is, um, you know, standard Washington, you know, sports slash politics. Well, why not? Why are people not talking about that? Well, because, again, from a partisan lens, you know, it would be interesting to watch Republicans come out and say, you know, we need to approve this pipeline immediately. But... It's a major problem that she might potentially have a conflict of interest here. So a lot of these things, you know, are driven just in this sort of partisan framework. Uh, and, you know, real issues are kind of obscured by it. So I don't think that there's a political incentive for a lot of people to bring up her holdings because Democrats are going to want to be defending her. Uh, and Republicans uh, are really strongly, strongly supportive of the pipeline. I think that's such an interesting um, point that because her, you know, conflict of interest uh, has to do with an issue that, you know, Republicans would actually side with her on, something they would agree on, uh, they're deciding uh, not to bring it up. But what do you think? I mean, when, when weighing a potential secretary of state, I mean, what qualities uh, should be looked at, and, and how much uh, you know significance should they, this be given? I know that you know in the presidential election, we were the conversation uh, every single hour of every single day was about Mitt Romney's taxes. A lot of people were saying, you know what, I don't care uh, how much money he makes. I, that's irrelevant. Um, what do you think are the you know most important points that that the American people should be thinking about, and that the American media should be talking about when it comes to whoever the next Secretary of State is? Well, I mean, there's definitely some basic questions of someone's, you know, intellect, their capacity. I think she definitely meets those marks. You know, she's obviously a very talented person. She's a very accomplished person. There's been areas where she's been right about, like uh, the invasion of Iraq. She was opposed to it from the beginning. Uh, and then, you know, the, the other questions that are really central that I want to see her pressed on are Rwanda, her whole policy towards Africa. That's really where she launched her career from as an Africa specialist. And I would say with regard to the holdings in TransCanada and other energy companies, uh, she needs to let go of them if she wants to be a credible candidate. I think that that's a totally black or white thing. And I hope uh, you know, you'll keep pushing on it and other people will keep pushing on it because that's very clear. There's not much ambiguity there. Let's talk a little bigger picture here, Michael, uh, not just dealing with Susan Rice, but about something that you pressed upon, which is that um, this really is uh, kind of, a, you know, the political media these days seems to have taken a lot of notes from ESPN and the way they cover sports. And, it, you know, it's interesting to watch. It's fast moving. And people, uh, at least, you know, a lot of 
producers and, and on our talent like to think that that their viewers like it when it's more of you know a sporting event um, you know this he said she said account talk a little bit about um, big picture here how the media uh, sort of does that and what you think the impact has been well I think you know there, there is an element to all of this of debate of argument and of entertainment and that's you know that's fine to a degree but I, I don't think it serves anybody to just constantly have a kind of very simplified and diluted debate. And it's funny, you know, you mentioned ESPN and, and everybody kind of says, well, we cover it like sports. But, you know, a lot of sports coverage is actually kind of more sophisticated. It will be a lot more details uh, about how teams are performing. There's kind of more, like, empirical reference points. Some of the conversations are a lot more kind of civil and interesting and detailed. So I think it's very... Uh, unhelpful whether we're talking about the budget or whether we're talking about these types of issues you know I think that specifically with regard to Benghazi you had a really horrible event happen and what it's really turned into is that basically Republicans are really terrified because President Obama has reversed the kind of poll numbers on who Americans trust with national security so again instead of having a broader discussion about national security about all of these other issues you're raising they're trying to score points and knock Obama down uh, in terms of his standing on those issues through Rice. And, you know, it's another just kind of Sunday morning argument, and it's not of really great service to anybody. Well, as always with you, an interesting discussion. Michael Brooks, producer of The Majority Report. Thanks so much. Hey, thank you so much.